Welcome to our uh, Warren K. Lewis Lecture. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome you today. Uh, we are actually recognizing um, our honored lecturer for this afternoon. But first, I would like to describe a little bit about Warren K. Lewis, who is uh, the founding department head in chemical engineering here at MIT. Uh, Doc Lewis, as he was affectionately, affectionately known by his students and associates, had an enormous impact on shaping this program and the field of chemical engineering as a whole. He received his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Breslau in Germany in 1908. He then joined MIT as an assistant professor in 1910 and was promoted to professor in 1914, a very short path. <laughs> he was the first head of this newly formed chemical engineering department, which originally started as a division of the Department of Chemistry here at MIT in the 1880s. Um, and uh, after the, the full separation from chemistry from 1920 to 1929, uh, he continued his uh, position as head. After that, he devoted himself to teaching, research, and consulting, and remained an influential member of the Department of Chemical Engineering until his death in 1975 at the age of 92. Now, uh, Lewis actually revolutionized the design of chemical engineering equipment with the concept of unit operations, which is something that we all know and use as chemical engineers. He was an eminent researcher and inventor, and he contributed much to the field of industrial chemistry with over 80 patents to his credit. For example, he pioneered the use of fluidized bed catalytic cracking and refining. That was his. Above all, Doc Lewis was a superb educator. His text called Principles of Chemical Engineering written with Walker and McAdams in 1923, first defined our discipline. His lectures are legendary for the combination of beautifully organized material and Socratic exchanges with students. And here you can see him uh, really at work in, in lecture, engaging his students. He was known to uh, sometimes uh, surprise a student or two, pull them out in his Socratic method, uh, and known for his uh, incredible engagement in teaching. Not surprisingly, Warren K. Lewis won many awards, among them the President's Medal of Science, the Pre President's Medal of Merit, and the Priestley Medal from the American Chemical Society. As a most fitting honor, our professional society, the AICHE, has honored him with the creation of the Warren K. Lewis Award, which recognizes outstanding education in chemical engineering. The Warren K. Lewis Lectureship, established here at MIT in 1978, was to recognize Professor Lewis's revolutionary impact on chemical engineering. By developing the concept of unit operations, first produced, proposed by A.D. Little and William Walker, he revolutionized the design of chemical engineering processes and equipment. Throughout his career, Professor Lewis was mindful of the needs of industrial practice. Accordingly, the Lewis Lecture features alternately speakers from industry and academia. And that leads us to our speaker today, Dr. Mauricio Futran, who is the Vice President of Advanced Technology in the Global Tech Services Group of Janssen Supply Chain at Johnson & Johnson, focusing on manufacturing process understanding and reliability. He does this by incorporating predictive modeling, inline measurements, data analytics, and other technologies into the full range of activities from R&D through scale-up, tech transfer, and life cycle management. The ultimate goal is, mo is to model predictive control and real-time release. Now, uh, Dr. Futran spent 28 years in various positions in pharma, product and process development at Merck and Company, Bristol Myers Squibb, where he was Vice President of Process R&D. He then joined Rutgers University and served as its department chair before moving to J&J. &J. Uh, Professor Futran is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He also served as its chair for the chemical engineering section and on its peer committee. He was also a member of the Board of Chemical Sciences and Technology, known as BCST, which is an, uh, an NRC panel. As an AICHE member, he serves on the awards committee. He's a member and former chair of Princeton's Chemical and Biological Engineering External Advisory Board, and he's been a member of several other external boards, including one at University of Illinois, Georgia Tech, and Rutgers. In fact, he's also been known to be heavily engaged in the edu educational process for many years, and very recently uh, engaged uh, the Rutgers Chemical Engineering Department. Here you can see a photo taken from uh, essentially uh, Rutgers University School of Engineering 
where Janssen Pharma provided $6 million to expand research in continuous manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. So uh, with that introduction, we're very pleased and honored to have Dr. Futran. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Hammond. It's, it's a real honor to be here. Totally would have never thought that you would invite me here. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, in one, what is really one of the very best known lectures in chemical engineering anywhere, right? So a, a true honor. Uh, so talking about bringing pharma manufacturing to the digital age, it, it may be a bit of a slogan. I don't know how much it is in academia. In industry, everybody's talking about digital, internet of things. You know, it's, it's become a collection of buzzwords. But there actually is some real substance behind it. Uh, and, and I think going digital in many ways is going to help us solve some of the challenges that we have in manufacturing. So we'll, we'll try to, to cover some of that today, uh, moving quickly uh, to fit this in an hour. Um, I had my own picture of Doc Lewis, uh, because really, I mean, in the end, uh, what, what are we going to say to the, I mean, this is, it comes directly from what he did, right? Uh, the concept of unit ops, of modeling, of control. It all started with him. So it, it's really awesome to, to be on a lecture in his name. Uh, so I'm with J&J. &J. J, J has a credo that we really try to follow every single day. We have failed in the past sometimes. But it was written in 1943 by uh, General Robert Wood Johnson. And it's really been a, a guide for the company for a long time. Uh, it speaks about the responsibilities first to patients, doctors, nurses, and so on, the people who use our products. That's number one. It talks about responsibility to our communities and our environment. It talks about responsibility to the employees. We are really very well treated. It's really an, a company very well focused on us. And then it says, and at the, at the end we worry about shareholders. If we do the three first things right, shareholders will benefit. And you know, it's, it's, it's been true since 1943, so there's real truth to that. Today, J&J &J reaches one billion clients, customers, patients per year. It's an, a stunning number. Um, and, and the goal is to go to the next billion. But uh, as you know, and, and you know, income inequality in the world has been in the news a lot. The next billion customers or patients uh, have a very different set of needs and ability to pay and access uh, the type of products that we make. So that's where, where our challenge starts, right? We have a, a manufacturing network. We, we've been making drugs for many, many years, uh, very well established, but it really needs to change if we're going to reach our aspirations. Um, so, so why digitization? The world is really changing a lot. We are, and I'll show you a little bit of data, but you know, therapies are becoming more and more targeted to a smaller and smaller group of patients. Because of the advances in biology and mechanistic understanding, we can, we're more and more doing that. Also, there are lo there's a lot of complexity coming to our pipeline. So today, we basically make small molecules and antibodies. And that covers just about everything we make in drugs. Um, that's over. We want to have all kinds of DNA, RNA, viruses as drugs, bacteria as drugs, you know, you name it, plasmids, we're going after it all. So how do we do this? How do we transform a traditional, well-established manufacturing operation to be able to do those things? Uh, we need to optimize manufacturing. Uh, we need to be a lot more agile. Today, if my friend Olaf here comes up with a brilliant idea to improve one of our biologics processes, we won't see that idea implemented in the market for two and a half years. That's just not sustainable, not, not in the way the world is evolving. Uh, we need flexibility, we need agility, and it's all going to be based on fundamental understanding of our drugs, our processes, and how we control them. And quality control needs to evolve as well. In today's world, we make a drug, we take a sample, run it to the lab. We sometimes wait longer to get lab results than we took us to make the drug. And then we see if we've passed or failed. And, and again, that's totally anathema to what we're trying to achieve here. We need to know in real time how we're doing 
and, and, and where this, uh, the quality of the drug that we're making. So, you know, uh, talking about targeted populations, it, it's an evolution. Uh, some drugs are still given very broadly, like antidepressants, and they'll work on 30% of the patients. But when you look at, uh, at the bottom, oncology drugs today, you know, uh, it, it's gotten a lot better. A given drug is now targeted to a well-defined, genetically defined group of patients that's going to actually benefit from that drug or, or a combination of the drugs. And on the right there a little bit is uh, the, the new thing that's been in, in the press a lot, the idea of the CAR T therapies, right? Where basically you take blood from a patient, purify the T cells, modify the T cells, and then bring them back to the patient. Uh, so now this is a batch of one, a, a, a single patient for every batch that you make. It's a totally new paradigm, but it brings opportunities that, um, that we need to be able to exploit. Now we can correlate the patient and his data and his history or hers, the process and how we run it, and the clinical outcomes. Right? It's an amazing opportunity that we really have to leverage um, that's really emerging in this field. But it doesn't have to be the $300,000 therapy that benefits from these ideas. There's a lot that we can do even with something like Tylenol. Uh, as we are able to collect data on the patients and their outcomes, and, and um, we can make better use of these kind of products. We can customize products, uh, again, to different populations. Um, so the, the, this is something that our network, our current philosophy of manufacturing is really not well set up to do. We're, we're going to uh, be looking more and more at, at uh, different med medicinal options for the same disease for different groups of people, younger, older, healthier, sicker, right? Uh, and it's not just the, the drug or, or, I mean, the, the dose or the strength. Uh, there may be modifications to the drug to its pharmacokinetic profile, right? So maybe some patients need to uh, metabolize it faster than others. So there's all kinds of adjustments that we can think of making. And on top of that, I mean, the packaging, the bottle, the label, the instructions, everything that goes along with it has to be more and more personalized. Um, and so that's where uh, we, we need to then bring together the diagnosis, the working with the doctors, the treatment, the mental state of the patient, the genetic makeup of the patient to all together bring it in, in, into the right uh, treatment. So this is an example of what we're doing in large molecules uh, at the Anson today, right? It's a big portfolio. We have about 50 projects of different kinds and at different stages of development. Uh, about 18 of them are recent license and acquisitions deals, three of them in, in 2018 alone. 13 programs uh, recently just entered the clinic. And there are at least 10 modalities, like I was saying, if, if not more. And it's a long list. Uh, and, and, and they are in flux. So some of them are very new. We're still learning how we're going to do it. The CAR-T is a great example right now. I mean, it has elements of brute force when we do CAR-T therapy. It's great because it can cure a cancer. It's amazing. But it, it's, it's not like just taking a pill, right? It, it really, the, the patient has to be brought to the ICU to get the treatment and stuff like that. So we need to have a tremendous amount of agility to manage these that's already in the pipeline. This is already happening. And, and, and we're going to have to be making commercial products for these modalities in the not too distant future. And yet where we are now, we're still building, this is our latest plant that we're building, it's a biologics plant. And again, it's mostly traditional. It's 15,000 liter bioreactors, thick stainless steel bolted to the ground. You know, it's gonna take in order to switch prod products, you have to clean it, you have to reset it. You have, you know, it it's not, it's going to serve the products that we have now. We didn't build it willy-nilly. We do need it. And there will always be a group of products that are large volume that need this kind of facility. That's fine. But what's coming down the pike is, is very different. And this is just not going to cut it anymore. Right. 
So here's what we're looking at. We're looking at uh, a manufacturing facility that's gonna be simple and very productive, right? We can put stuff in one room. Today, a lot of the operations we do, you have a suite for the chromatography and a suite for the filtration, certainly a separate suite for the bioreactor, all those things, right? We're looking at having it all modular and flexible. <clears throat> a lot of it uh, has to be uh, single use. That's been growing a lot. We want, uh, what, when it, here's where the digital part comes in. We want to know through models, either me mechanistic models and you know, correlational mo models, um, the ability to control the process. We need real-time data, real-time understanding. Um, it's modules that you bring and you plug and play. That's, <clears throat> that's what's gonna make it really agile, right? If I wanna switch project products, I can just take certain and the disposable pieces, just throw them out, some new skids of different operations, plug them in, and we can do in two hours what normally takes us three weeks, right? And this is not a pipe dream. A lot of people are working on these things, and a lot of these elements that are in this picture are already, <coughs> different companies are already putting them in place. <laughs> One thing that's very important, I think, is this last two, real-time release review by exception. Uh, so we, we don't want to send a sample to a lab and wait for the results at the end, right? We want to know on, on a real-time basis how we're doing. If we have actual real control, if we have models, if we have data analytics, we should be able to control and know what's going on on a real-time. And review by exception, we use the computers in the digital world to, to track everything else, not just the process, but What's the status of the training for the operator, right? What is the release status of the raw materials that we used? All these things a computer can check and the minute the batch is out, gives you the green light, you can go from there. So this is our goal. We know it's reachable. We need to figure out exactly how fast we can get there and how much it's gonna cost, because that does matter. But we certainly have been looking at, okay, how are we gonna get there? And, and, and we have uh, basically three pillars, three uh, basic things that we need to do here. The first one is the digitization process control. We have our multivariate analytics models that are real time, model, models that are offline. Uh, we have electronic recipes. We have electronic bills of materials, all these things. We can make a product file that contains all the information we need to run it, understand it, control it, and assure the quality all in one place. The other thing is intensification. That's something that as an industry, we really haven't been paying much attention to. Um, if you talk to the oil people or in the chemical industry, they've done a lot of that. For us, I mean, it, it's amazing. This is a group of chemical engineers. Continuous manufacturing is still a bit of a novelty in the pharmaceutical industry, something that Doc Lewis was probably doing already uh, so many years ago, right? Um, so we are starting to do the continuous bit in, in both small and large molecules. Uh, we know that you can bring other elements, like uh, especially when you do the biologics, right? You can. Uh, increase the titers. You can design nowadays cell lines that are much more productive. You can use media that makes them much more productive. Overall, when we look at both small and large molecules, we know we can reduce the traditional footprint of our equipment by a factor of 10. I mean, this is not a little bit. That's a lot, right? <laughs> and so we need to drive these things, and we need to work with our colleagues in R&D because we want to design the flow chemistry from day one, and there are several people we've been talking here today that are actually doing that, right? Certainly in the drug product, and there are a lot of opportunities in the larger molecules as well. And again, and the last thing is modular, automated, and mobile, right? because uh, we need to be able to do plug and play. We need to have, and I put it modular in red because this is the direct link to Doc Lewis, right? You take every unit operation and you put that in its own skid with its own software and you can plug and play with, I mean, today if we change anything in an equipment, we have to go and do valid revalidations and all this documentation and blah, blah, blah. We need to do that once, be able to plug all these units together and, and run in a much more agile way
And, and other driving force, by the way, is many countries now are saying, if you want to sell your drug in my country, you make it in my country. So if we are not able to do these simplified, single room, plug and play modular systems, we're just not going to get there. So it, it's, it's a huge challenge, but I think uh, we have a good plan and we're looking to really bring our company and uh, the industry, we, we all go there together. So the value, right? Uh, so starting from your left, uh, there is a the business excellence. If you have a digitized, truly digital system, you, you can put all kinds of things together. You know customer orders on one side, you know your manufacturing timelines and, and yields, you know uh, all the distribution logistics, all that is being digitized to put it in, into a world where then we can re-expand very quickly. But if you don't have the process part, then there's this big hole in the middle. And, and there are a lot of places that are worrying about the planning and supply and blah, 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 but not the process. The process needs to be digitized as well. Uh, the digital twins put, they play a huge role. I mean, that's, that's modern terminology. It's just a mechanistic model in our minds, but it, it's the modern parlance that people talk about. Um, that allows you to control and understand your process. If you can express it as a mathematical model, you know you understand it. And, and I already described the digital product file where all these digital elements come together. And in the end, at the right, what we're looking for is really uh, advanced process control, adaptive process control. And again, that's something that in today's environment is anathema, right? The, the regulators want you to always run it the same way. It's a black box, you run it the same way. That gives us confidence that you're doing the right thing. And we're saying, yeah, but the temperature changes, the season changes, the raw materials will have changes. All kinds of things change. We want to do engineering controls here, not just procedural controls. Um, so that's the goal, that's where we're going to go. And we have already been doing these things, like I said. Uh, all these things that I'm talking about have been done one way or another by someone somewhere. We've done our share and continue to push. So Xi'an is a, a city in China. That's where they have the Terracotta Warriors. Really worth visiting if you ever get the chance. Um, and we've had a plant in Xi'an for a long time and then the local government told us the city grew up, grew around our plant and engulfed it. So they said, you've got to get out. You're going to go to this uh, industrial park. You're going to build a new facility. And we used it as an opportunity to make it into a state-of-the-art facility, which is really nice. And in so doing, we had to transfer 21 different products. Um, and again, this was an opportunity to look at this and say, if we do this the traditional way, which is, by the way, in our industry, in a lot of industry, all these things are done empirically. You just try it and tweak it. Uh, it was going to cost a huge amount of money and bring us all kinds of delays getting things going. So when you look at the traditional way of doing it, there are a bunch of activities on your left that you have to do. You, know, you, you build it, you commission qualification, uh, you do all your technical assessments, you, you transfer analytical methods because we still test it in the lab, right? Uh, and then you go into what we like to call the characterization phase. But this is full-scale test, you know, empirical testing. What I was doing in my old plant, will it work in the new plant with the new modern equipment? And in the industry, this is not just us. You know, people spend countless hours and weeks in huge amounts of money in raw materials in the active ingredient that goes into these things so that eventually you can put it in a more or less stable place and then you can click your heels three times, right? This is the validation stage where you run the process three times the same way and, 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 and you live it happily ever after because uh, you, you, you better not change anything because we don't know what's going to happen. So we, we, um, these, this has a high material cost and also if you're running all these batches and you don't even know how many it's going to take you to come to more or less of a sweet spot, um, the, the delay on, on getting the facility up and running is huge. We're talking 21 products, and we're talking a multi-hundred million dollar facility. So th this was no joke. So basically, we decided to take out that characterization phase completely and use process models instead. Uh, 
and we did only a single confirmation batch to make sure that we didn't miss something because we're not yet that bold, but a single batch uh, and, and brought all these reduction in time and in costs. And indeed, they, they actually, the risk of failure, the risk of problems was much lower than doing the traditional way. If you look at uh, what we did, and you know, the, the top, this is the, I don't know if you can read it, it's months across the top, right? So the traditional, the original plan would have taken almost eight months of empirical taste, testing. You see there is no even spaces in between the various products, right? We were just going, assuming, even assuming that everything went very well, uh, it, it took forever. Uh, so we came in with a target plan that was much more compressed, focused on a single confirmation batch for everything we did. And in the end, <coughs> as we brought the data and the models and we learned, uh, we were able to do it in an even much shorter way. We, we, you know, we were able to show, for example, that two products had such similar processes that the same model could be used for both and the like. And so this is really what happened. We did go and get data at lab scale and pilot scale. We certainly did that. And we ran some DOEs at that scale, as shown here on your left. You know, some of the edges of the triangle and in the, in the, of the cube and the center of the cube. And then we took those data and the various types of models. We had some mechanistic models, some statistical models, some empirical testing. But in the end, we used that to create these models and using sensors. And then we ran the models to get more information on more conditions than we ever would have otherwise. And this should be obvious, right? But uh, industry doesn't do a lot of this, even not pharma, and certain, and, but other industries either. And so we put together a nice package, what we call the digital twin. You know, on the left, you have the different steps of making tablets. Tablets were a fair number of the products that we transferred. Um, so, you know, granulation was done through mechanistic modeling. I'll cover that in a minute. The blending, we simply use the sensor. You can put an ERR sensor that tells you when things are already blended. You don't have to go beyond that. Uh, statistical models for, for the tableting, and uh, again, mechanistic models for the coding. Uh, and the idea is to, we're not trying to, this is not PhD thesis. I think this is a lot of stuff that junior chemical engineers should be able to do. Uh, and, but we use the most fit for purpose methodology and actually also work with the Chinese FDA to explain what we were doing. They were good with the idea after a lot of explanation. So we were able to implement it. So when we talk about, say, the, the, the fluid bed granulation, right? You have a mixture of powders that can tend to segregate. So you want to make them into a homogeneous granule that will not longer segregate. So what you do is you put it in a fluidized bed, you spray a liquid with a binder in it, and you evaporate the water at the same time. So you end up with a, these granules that then you can take to your tablet press and make them into tablets. And so the basic model is, thermodynamic model is really, a, again, very basic heat and mass balanced uh, model, <clears throat> but it turned out to be really useful. The other element, of course, is going to be the fluidization, particle collisions, all that stuff. That is, that, to do that analytically, that would be a PhD thesis, and we did not do that. But you can do a lot of measurements of particle velocities and stuff and, and find a, a set of settings that if you leave it there, you're going to be OK. And the same thing with the idea of the liquid that you spray, because you're making uh, droplets. You need to make droplets that are big enough that they will actually make it all the way to the particles and wet them. You don't want them too big. You don't want to make soup. You don't want them too little. Then it all evaporates, and you're just making dust instead of granulating your product. right? So we took all these three things together and, and, and made our basic model. So there's a schematic there on the right of how the equipment looks. You, you can see the green particles and the uh, spray arm uh, on top of that. Uh, and on the left is the typical profile of the LOD, the, the moisture content of the bed, which in the end, when you fix the fluidization and you fit, fix the spray, this determines how these things are going to granulate. The, how, you know, the, the slope of the curve going up, the maximum moisture that you're going to achieve, and then the slope of the curve coming down. Um, 
and, and, and you can explore that mountain and, and, and do as many in silico experiments as you want, and, and then you, you, you can get to the optimal, right? And so our uh, very good engineer we have out of ETH who was working on this, uh, he named the, the software Sherpa because it's our guide to the mountain. So I thought it was very good. And so, I mean, here is just a little bit of a uh, illustration. Uh, in, in the end, uh, you, you see on the left, you, you, we can, it's a simulator. We run a whole lot of uh, <clears throat> runs to understand uh, where the sweet spot is. Uh, on the right, uh, we, we tested an awful lot of failure modes and pushed them and made you know, consecutive failure modes to understand, again, I have absolute certainty that we know how the, this runs. This is the one example, one unit up, but we did this across the board. Um, in the bottom, you see the, the fluidization and the map of different particle speeds depending on the location. So that's the kind of stuff we did. And, and in the end, this becomes model predictive control. We have the model. Um, we have, if you go to the right on top, uh, we have near AI measurements that give us the moisture content directly. We use schemometric models to translate spectra, in you know, AI spectra, to actual concentrations. Uh, we return that to the Sherpa model, which tells us, okay, this is where you are, this is where you should be, here is your control action, and then that goes back to the operator to do it. We're still doing it open loop like this, uh, we didn't have the faith yet that we could get this through the FDA in a fully automated manner. And also, culturally, at the plant, they were just not ready for the whole thing. But it's the same effect. So another thing that I touched on that I think is, is, is a very important part of our goals is the idea of real-time release. Uh, right? If I have my sensors, if I have my models, if I have my data analytics, I should be able to know instantly that this batch is, is ready to be released. We recently, uh, well, we, we've been some of the, you know, working with Rutgers, like Dr. Hammond told us. Um, we got our first, uh, we were one of the very first people to get a continuous tableting line approved by the FDA, and now it's 10 other countries already has been approved. But then on top of that, we've now gone back and did real-time release, given the parametric data given the PAT data, we were able to submit and get approved uh, a predictive model, especially for this solution. Some things like the content uniformity of the tablets, the assay of every tablet, you can measure that with near IR, right? So that's, but we wanted to do, the, if you don't know, when we, you make tablets, you need to have a certain sample of tablets. And uh, it needs to be uh, tested in the dissolution bath. It's a little agitated beaker, and you have to get a certain percentage of the tablet dissolved in a certain amount of time. So normally, again, that's, you go to the lab, and it takes a number of days or weeks sometimes to get those results so you can release it. So we got, uh, we got it approved for Presista. Uh, it's based on the process data and, and the PAT. And this gives us an awful lot of agility, like we said before. Uh, and it's one more of the building blocks to get to this ideal factory at the end that we're going for. Um, again, historically, when we were releasing tablets, basically seven instruments, seven tests, and, and many days or weeks to, to get through all of it, because again, it's not the only product in the plant. Things get backed up in the lab, all those things, right? Nowadays, uh, you, you have on the left purity and stability and sterility. I mean, purity is something that is set by your incoming materials. It's not something you need to release. Sterility doesn't necessarily apply to tablets. But everything else is done on one instrument, usually in minutes, rather than they all take it to the lab to get the answer. Um, and it, it has other advantages that you might not have thought of. You, traditionally, these things are done by HPLC. HPLC equipment, as you see on the left, takes a huge footprint. Again, you're doing multiple products, lots of batches. 
And even environmentally, the amount of solvent, the amount of acetonitrile, if nothing else, that is used by these labs is spectacular. You wouldn't believe it. I'm not going to give you the numbers, but it's, it's stunning how much we, we, and it's all sent out, right, for, for disposal. Whereas the near IR is a small equipment, small footprint, no, none of the environmental impact. So the savings just from that have been really quite real. Come on. And so, I mean, on the left here is a schematic of, of, of our continuous line. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details, but you feed from the top and you blend and you compress and eventually you, you coat. Uh, when, when you do this in batch, though, you take samples in, in two or three times during your production. And these are samples that you're taking from a batch of tablets that's been all mixed up, right? So you don't know whether this is a tablet was made or early or late. And you, know, you can have a batch of 10 million tablets and you're gonna end up only sampling six tablets three times or something like that. So if there are issues with some of the tablets floating around, the chance that you're gonna detect it is very low. If you look on, on, on the bottom, and this is a, a different scale, right? On, on the continuous line, what we do is accumulate tablets in what we call little quarantine hoppers. And the beginning of, and end of each hopper is tested. Right? So we're testing many, many more times, many, many more tablets. And we're testing in sequence. So if there's drifting, if there's a trend that's developing, we can pick it up. Whereas in traditional batch, you, you'd never pick it up. And it's, it's really proven to be a very, very powerful approach. Again, like we did with the fluid bed granulator here, we did a fair amount of experimentation. We ran a lot of DOEs, and we ran the DOEs in a very broad parameter space, so we have certainty that anything that happens we have covered, and yet we run the process in a small box inside that, so it's very tightly controlled. And the process variation that we get is really low. Um, and again, I don't know if this is something you've heard or, you know, there was actually, what, about 2003 or something when the New York Times said that, you know, potato chip makers were more sophisticated manufacturers than pharma. And the idea to achieve Six Sigma in pharma was like, this is never going to happen. Well, it's there. We're doing it, right? We, we, what, you know, the, the content uniformity and the uh, assay of, of, of the tablets are being measured in real time. They are essentially straight lines very, very far away from, you know, the, the, the control limits. Uh, uh, on the right, you see uh, the model, um, the, you know, the I, 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 API concentration versus tablet weight. And, and, and we are in that little zone, red zone in the center, even though the model extends all the way out. So we were able to show statistically to the FDA that there is a 0% probability of failing dissolution if we, all we have to make sure is there's enough amount of active in the tablet. If the amount of active in the tablet is right, we're good. And, and that's really it. I'm, I'm proud, it's, it's really big accomplishments. Um, and so then now, uh, how, how do we bring this and, and start to integrate everything, right, into a, a system of really advanced process control? Um, and, and here is one example and another example. This is from bioreactors, right? So uh, the, the Pi historian is the system we have that captures all the process data. You know, there are hundreds of variables associated with running a bioreactor. It's not just the bioreactor itself, but the set points of all your valves and air flows and all kinds of stuff, right? So a, a huge number of variables. And you look at that diagram and no human can, can look at that and tell you what's good, what's bad, or how to improve this, right? So. Again, doing very basic uh, multivariate analytics. We put it all into one picture. Uh, you see the, the blue lines, you know, the plus minus three sigma. And then in the middle, the green line with the red dot at the end, that's the batch that you're running and how it compares to all the other batches that you've ever run. Um, so you have a, a, an immediate visual of how your batch is doing. And it gives the people on the floor access to data and understanding that they never had before. So here, for example, if uh, on the top you can see, maybe, so there is a deviation, right? Uh, there, there is some, 
all of a sudden your blue line in the middle is getting out of your red limits. Um, having these data analytics, you can immediately query the program and it's going to tell you which are the variables right, that, that are causing this deviation. And because it's multivariate, sometimes it's combinations of two or three variables, none of which independently, because we always have alarms. If, some, if your temperature, if your pH, something goes off, it's, it's not an alarm. None of them are in the alarm stage, but the combination is telling you that you have a problem. And then you can dig down in the bottom to the one specific variable or two uh, that is causing you the problem. You see it at the right end of the, of the diagram there. And, and the operator, the supervisor, then is able to intervene and, 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 and adjust the batch. And, and this has given us a tremendous amount uh, of power and of savings. Um, and again, one, one of the caveats, uh, I'll let you read it. Uh, in, in today's world of data analytics and, and the lay press that's it's dominated by Google and it's dominated by Amazon. You know. There's the idea that you just take whatever data is there and, 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 and you can predict anything. Um, and first of all, you know, if uh, Amazon predicts the wrong thing that you want to buy, it has zero consequences. If we do a wrong prediction on a batch, it really has real consequences. And uh, there is a tendency to just say, you know, well, I see a correlation, therefore I know what's going on. But correlation is not causation. That's a very important thing we've learned. We, we do data analytics by, is done by engineers who understand the process, not just the data analytics. And, and that's where the, the powerful really comes in. Uh, if you don't have that combination of the two, you really get nonsense. And yeah, you can multiply it, whatever, and it still means nothing. And, and the other thing is the data has to be relevant. One of the things we've learned as we do this, there are certain parameters, like I showed you the fluid bed granulator and the moisture trajectory, right? Guess what? We don't, we don't ever measure that traditionally. No, no one in pharma measures that, right? You, you measure the incoming air temperature and humidity and your spray rate and this and that. But those don't have a lot of meaning. The, the, the trajectory of the moisture has meaning. And if you're not tracking that, you can do all the data analytics you want. You're not going to get to the essence of the problem because you're not looking at the data that actually matters. And so we, we're advancing through installing these models throughout various kinds of uh, processes. I just gave you a, a few examples. And again, we start, like I showed you, just, you can start with just monitoring, understanding uh, what the batch is doing and intervening is necessary. You can then start doing actual uh, batch prediction. You know, am I going to reach the titer that I need in my 40 days that I'm running this thing? Uh, then we start actually forecasting uh, process parameters. So, um, I mean, we were talking to Chris Love, right? So if you do a perfusion reactor, you have a spin filter in there or internal or external. Sometimes you have to change it during the run. When is the best time to change it? What is the basis for changing it? We can now start uh, forecasting these things and, and, and making it better. And, and then eventually you actually get to optimization, right? All your parameters, whether it's your tighter, uh, your quality, end up on a distribution. Uh, you want to be on the, tail, the right tail end of the distribution every time. And it's these kind of tools that let you understand what are the variables that bring you there, and you start really reaping those benefits. And of course, in the end, we put it all together. We're not there yet to have real-time adaptive process control. And I don't know if this is very visible here, but one of the things we're doing is the use of inline technology, inline sensors. And this is, we're looking at the use of Raman in bioreactors. Again, many of our processes uh, are long, 40, 60 days. So having the Raman is really useful. And here is uh, the issue of uh, the, the sensitivity that you get with this uh, probe uh, to a contamination event. You know, something else started growing there. So this is not even any of the process parameters changing. And yet this thing is really able to pick it up and pick it up very quickly. So here is just one example of uh, checking hourly versus every 10 minutes, and you find it two hours earlier. 
Um, there's been recently an issue with one of our vendors where they look for contamination by taking samples and taking them to the lab, and we found it three days earlier. Right? And this has tremendous value now because now you can tell what it correlates to. Did you add some antifoam? Did you add some glucose? What is it that you did that caused the contamination? If you can detect it right away, you can say that and find that out and fix it. Other ones, you, you really can't. And, and so we, we, we're using more and more this fingerprinting. Here's another example of uh, pH drifting. So again, you, you start getting out of your plus minus three sigma. You get the alarm. You can see it uh, uh, zoom in, in there. Um, like I said before, you can then go into all the variables, and it's going to tell you which variables are causing this. The key one here is, is pH. It, one particular pH probe, right? The probe is drifting. We have a backup probe that's still okay. We have some offline measurements, that's okay. So we know exactly what to do. We need to just switch out that probe and, and, and change it. Um, and if you go all the way around here, in the end, yeah, you fix that, the batch is good. Um, and, and you wouldn't believe it, but things like this, when you didn't have the real time data and stuff, it will go to the point of ruining a batch. And every batch, just all the consumables, or the media, uh, all that, it, it's an awful lot of money. And, and here's the one that's my favorite. I'm going to focus only the one on the left. So this is one of our plants. It was the first plant where we installed this multivariate analytics. And you're looking at the number of batches run without making an error. OK, the median before we did this, since the plant opened, was about nine, 10 batches. Right now, since we installed it, we are approaching 60 batches, and we're still going strong. So it's amazing what you know, the operating crew can do with a little bit of access to real-time data and understand what is drifting when, when things go uh, off, the, off the rails. And so, yeah, sensors become very, very important. And we start moving away from the black box treatment of a bioreactor, right? Uh, traditionally, was we check temperature, pH, dissolve oxygen, CO2 maybe. We, we, we adjust the shear with the agitator speed. Uh, but uh, now when we bring Raman, I gave you an example, and, and capacitance probes, which give you the relaxation uh, of the cells, uh, you start getting a fingerprint, a digital fingerprint for the process. Uh, that, that just takes you totally in, in, in a new direction. And then you can combine these with the multivariate analytics. Right? Your Raman spectra become part of the multivariate analysis and, and, and you gives you all this insight into the um, quality attributes and the yield you can expect. So we have, you know, you look at all the various um, stages of uh, doing a bioreactor, you know, it, you can probe your raw materials, your seed train, your actual bioreactor using different spectroscopic approaches, capacitance in the seed train, and so on. We can, um, going still down the road, right? Uh, spectroscopic techniques, techniques for the harvest, the filtration, mass spec for multi attributes. That's, it, it's growing now, and it, again, it brings a whole nother dimension of information. Um, a lot more Raman uh, and other, you know, UV for protein concentration, all kinds of stuff. You can put all that together, uh, and we can really start optimizing the performance across the whole line. We're not quite there yet, but we're moving there fast. So Raman, right? Uh, I mean, you guys know about Raman and how it works, but. Uh, it puts us, uh, it gives us a tremendous amount of knowledge. So here are Raman fingerprints for batches in a facility in three different years, right? So the three different colors are three different years. So we can see through this that even though we went from year to year and people do the little tweaks and stuff, but all our batches are in this one region. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that we can even bring to the regulators to say, when we run things, when we do tech transfers, whatever, if I'm in this region, I'm good. And, and we can say that with quite a high uh, degree of certainty. 
And then we can use the, the Raman for a number of other measurements, which I'm having trouble reading here, but um, maybe here. Yeah, so this one is viable cell density, for example, tighter. Um, a number of things that you wouldn't even think you can do with Raman, uh, which are more than just a chemical fingerprint, like viable cell density and the concentration of various, uh, it's in the table, right, the various metabolites and stuff. Uh, and you can see that the, the errors are very small. This is really a very robust measurement. And then you're using that now more and more for control. The, the key one here is the top left. I mean, traditionally, that's why people run bioreactors. You, know, you give it a shot of glucose every day whether it needs it or not. And so you see the trace there of the glucose, and it is surprising how much variability there is. And even late in the game where the glucose is supposed to be overall coming down, but you have spikes that go way up there, right? So by controlling those things, and because we can see the trajectory of, of the titer in, in the metabolites in the viable cell density, you can now come up with a feeding strategy on real-time basis that is going to optimize the whole thing, all through one tool. Um, so again, back, all these things become our digital file. And yeah, it, 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 it's going to have an impact on the operations, but quality assurance, quality control, uh, development, development timelines are going to become shorter, right? Uh, and the whole integration with the, the planning element and the regulatory. The regulatory agencies are learning with us, but more and more we're looking at the possibility that we don't release batches based on a set of tests at the end, but we use the inline sensors and the multivariate analytics, all these things together to give you a picture that gives you much better assurance that the batch is good than you get today by running, you know, eight tests at the end of, of the day. And so again, uh, back to the CAR T. Um, you you start with a patient in the, you know, leukophoresis where you take the cells and purify the T cells, selection and activation of the cells, transfection, expansion of the modified T cells, and then back to the patient, right? Uh, an amazing opportunity to connect all these elements. There is, e even in, with all the biology we know today, it's very hard to predict <clears throat> given given the process or, or the, your product, your, your cells that you're going to put part on the patient, how are the patient going to react, right? And we don't even know what to measure, really, yet. We measure a bunch of stuff, but we don't know that it's the relevant stuff that you really need for prediction. So again, starts with the patient data, the process <coughs> making of the lentivirus that's going to give us a plasmid, the, the release testing data and the patient data, and together we're hoping we're going to have a much better picture for the regulators and for the patients than we have today. So there are gaps and there are challenges in <clears throat> making all this a reality. A lot of, uh, of it has to do with data. Uh, you know, data from R&D doesn't necessarily correlate to data in commercial. Um, in fact, um, we don't have data rules. Data, this digital area is, is new and we, we, you need what we call a data thread. What are the rules for each data? The, the nomenclature, the, the units, the decimal places, who owns it, who updates it, all that really doesn't exist. And we have, J&J &J in particular is an agglomeration of companies that have been purchased. So each site, each place has different systems, different approaches. It's a huge, uh, it, it's a huge challenge for us. Um, you know, the, the evolution of the regulatory environment is still happening, still in its early days. And beyond the FDA and the EMEA, um, you know, there are a lot of agencies out there that haven't even begun to, to think about these things. So, last slide. Um, these multivariates monitoring, control, and optimization is a reality. We're doing it. Uh, we can 
use it to bring a level of quality assurance that's much higher than what's been there traditionally. Um, the most exciting thing we're going to be testing then with a new plant, we show you on the construction, the equivalent of different of processes at different scales and different sites can be established using these techniques and these sensors. Uh, and we're really getting away from the biologist, the process defines the product. We can figure out what the product is today. Uh, and again, standardizing regulatory expectations is still a problem, still a challenge, but we're going to do it. So I think I took a little longer than I thought when I practiced it, but I'm open for questions. Thank you, and Dr. Putran, before we open for questions, Mauricio, we would like to present to oh, you, thank you the plaque, recognizing that you have given the Warren K. Lewis Lecture. Thank you very much. It's wonderful, and uh, we are very happy to have you here. Great, thank you. Excellent, thank you. We have microphones on either side, so if folks who want to ask questions can gradually line up. And we'll allow a little bit of time for uh, anyone who wants to ask the first question to make it to the microphone, since we're trying to uh, capture everything on. Uh... I have a quick question. Um, sure. So great talk, of course. Uh, you know, I love this stuff, of course. <laughs> it's amazing how, um, how much has happened in the last five years, right, in terms yeah. of monitoring, modeling, and control in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the question I have, though, is actually more of kind of a technical, narrow question, which is um, there's, there's uh, companies like Eli Lilly that have looked at trying to do, um, you know, direct compression. You basically skip all the granulation and all of that. Yeah. So, so the question I had um, is what do you think is, is – I understand that certain doses – it's going to be harder for low dose than high dose. Right. I mean, of course, right? But I guess my question is, is um, how, how so soon do you think that that could really be practicable, you know, in terms of – getting rid of granulation and milling and all this sort of intermediate steps, just going straight from the, more or less the crystallizer to the tablets. Yeah. I, I really think that it depends on the reason that you're granulating. Most of the time, people granulate because there's segregation, right? So if, uh, if you put in a continuous line and your working volume is a liter and you're doing hundreds of kilos, where is the stuff going to hide, right? You cannot segregate. It's not, the only thing, depending, some APIs will stick to the walls and then release, right? But there are ways that you can deal with that. So if you're dealing with segregation, you just, you just go direct compression and it's going to work. Sometimes the, the powder blend on its own will not compress enough. There are other reasons why people do it, right? And, and those are special cases that you, you, you have to deal with. And ideally, you just change the formula and you start designing formulas from the beginning for direct compressions. And that's where we're headed, yeah. Additional questions? Hi, thanks uh, again. Also, I want to say it was a great talk and, well, something we're working hard on too, as you know. I know. Uh, very specific question on the Prezista, you, you use that as a highlight for uh, drug loading, getting within very narrow specs of uh, right. drug loading. Uh, could you just say a little bit more how you did that online? I think typically it's HPLC, which obviously isn't very practical for you. No, no, line. we do near IR. Just near IR? Yeah. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the drug on, itself? On the blend and on the tablets. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Too. Excellent talk. I'm going to ask a less detailed question. So we talked this morning a lot about the future of manufacturing and right. thinking about agility and supply chains and where this is headed. From a regulatory standpoint, you know, we're going to be able to do all of these things well before that environment has caught up. How do we work with them? How do we think about changing the mindset there? Well, the good news is that, again, FDA, EMEA, even Japan, the, the leadership of the agencies is interested in doing these things and they're sending the signals. And they certainly are, the US and the Europeans have set up these emerging technology groups that you can go talk to, you, you've been there. Um, but then, like you said, in the end you file it and there is some reviewer that if somebody dies, it's his hide or her hide, so they're gonna be more conservative. So it's, it's a slug. You need to keep meeting with them. 
uh, in the real, even for the real-time release of Persist. I mean, I can't give too much detail, but we got a complete response. That's uh, public knowledge, and we had to go back and talk again and argue again and file again, and you know, uh, and we have to go through these cycles, and little by little, uh, it, it, it's going to be the norm. So we need patients uh, because their job is to the best of their ability to protect the patient, and they honestly trying to do that, right? So we need to educate them. Additional questions? And I encourage, oh yes, Greg, would you like? I, I can speak mm -hmm. now. <laughs> of course, manufacturing is important because uh, uh, if you're going to sell something, you have to make it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, from an economic point of view, if you have savings in manufacturing, how much they contribute to the bottom line? It's extremely variable, right? Uh, I mean, if you can take a uh, bioreactor process from two grams per liter to 15, um, that's, that's real money that you're gonna save in materials and stuff. And the other thing is, you're not gonna have to build another plant of hundreds of millions of dollars very soon, right? So it's real money. Encourage, yes, yeah. Thank you, so uh, this is really a great talk and it's really impressive to see how the digitalization could improve like in terms of time and the product quality. Uh, so my question is uh, because I used to work in a QC lab doing all the release testing and the HPLC in process control testing. I just wonder as we enter the digitalization, uh, is that gonna ultimately replace the QC lab like the traditional release testing and in-process control. Yeah, we hope. Like it's, it's good you can get a PhD because uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, I mean, as an aspirational goal, we say, when do we build a plant with, with no lab? Mm -hmm. We're not there yet, right? And in biologics, you have sterility, you have viral contamination, you have all kinds of things that we still don't know how to do it in, with a real-time mm -hmm. sensor, but a lot of people are working on it, including here, so. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? I encourage a few more of our graduate students to join us in asking questions. And in the meantime, while you're thinking about that, I have one of my favorite questions for <laughs> Warren K. Lewis, who was such an educator. Do you have suggestions about what our PhD should be studying or learning about to be prepared for this uh, uh, kind of revolution that you just talked about? Yeah. And that's an interesting one, and I don't think, maybe all of those, but I don't have a, a tremendously direct answer. We do think, and, and we already talked to you, right, that having more exposure to statistical techniques is important. Um, and that's a small piece. But in the end, I mean, what, what we look for and what is going to drive this and is the uh, having people that are strong scientists, strong engineers, quantitative, comfortable with quantitative approaches and creative. Um, you know, even 6 a.m. this morning, I was talking to some people in, in Belgium because they're freaking out. All these new modalities are coming. Viruses, bacteria, these, that. What am I going to do? Who are we going to hire? We need to hire 25 people right now and every year. It's, it's chill. You get a <laughs> few good engineers, some that are really good in chemistry, some that are really good in biology. You'll be fine. <laughs> we know, you know, they'll learn it. <laughs> And, and, and so to me, it's that ability to learn and the curiosity that will take care of it. Yeah. Excellent. Do we have any additional questions? Yes, Martin. <laughs> so I just have a generic question about digitalization. This is happening in many different industries, including non-biological ones that oh, I'm yeah. involved in. So there's a sense, you mentioned, you know, from Google and Amazon that we just have to collect data and then we will find these correlations and that will allow us to sort of design and right. run processes, but there's still a role for traditional science and engineering. So how do those two come together? So in the end, if you just have data, it's not transferable. You go to a new system, you don't have the data yet, so you can't predict or design. So somehow you have to combine, you know, the stuff that we <coughs> teach here at MIT today plus sort of the the data approaches. So what's your view on that in this field? Yeah, I mean, that, that was the Dilbert cartoon, right? The, uh, 
you, you, data science gives you correlations that do not imply causation. So we know causation because we are chemical engineers. And that's where they come together. So to me, data analytics needs to be done by a very good chemical engineer, ideally. We'll accept other disciplines as well. But <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that, that you, you stay with things that have a physical meaning and, and, and yeah. Now the data challenge is huge, uh, but we have to do it. I mean, again, people talk about this as the fourth industrial revolution, right? Uh, for all the other revolutions, we, we have rules. We have ASME standards for the tank under pressure. We have, you know, recipe standards for automation. All those things are there. We don't have rules for data. And it's all over the place. And sometimes it's in a data system, and sometimes it's in a notebook in somebody's drawer. And it's a, a major effort to go away from that to a system where the first person in research that collects some piece of data knows what to put in there and where to put it, and we grow it from there. And it's going to take a while. We're spending a lot of time and a lot of agita uh, trying to get the data we need out of the different systems and different plants. This may be a very simple question, uh, but in addition to being interested in all of the technical aspects of the presentation you gave today, I'm both a J and J shareholder and a Jensen uh, customer. Um, and the one thing that surprised me is I started a new medication recently, Xarelto. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference in the tablet uh, by itself struck me as being very different from any tablet I had ever run into before in my uh, lifetime. Hmm. Could you, it's instead of being uh, either oval or round and appearing like a tablet, uh, it's triangular. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much smaller than any tablet. Uh, but clearly it's been put together with some new processes or maybe a new unit operation for how you tablet a 20 milligrams of a, uh, an active pharmaceutical. Could you tell us a little bit about um, what sorts of new unit operations uh, or ways of making uh, and packaging those sorts of products are being invented as you look at some of these kinds of things uh, as you yeah. develop some of this advanced digital technology. Actually, Zarelto is made by very traditional technology. We do have products like Zarelto, and you see these out there if you buy Zantac or you know, if you've seen the ads for uh, you know, the erectile dysfunction tablets and stuff like that. A lot of people driven by the marketing departments like to have a unique shape and color and all that stuff, right? Um, but that, that does not require a different type of equipment. When you go to small tablets, fairly small tablets, yeah, you, you do need to modify your tablet press. There's what we call the multi-tip technology, so it's not just one punch at a time, but it's a bunch of little punches, three, four, or five, that get done at the same time, but it's a very traditional technology. We are looking at other technologies other than compression for making tablets, um, but we're not ready to talk about it yet. Excellent. Are there any further questions from our audience? I had one last question, which was uh, about data. Is there uh, a plan or thought or um, an effort to enable companies to share data company to company. I'm thinking about, <laughs> which is very tricky, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm thinking about the fact that if we um, see the evolution of uh, uh, data analysis methods and machine learning that could lead to better refinement of processes, would that be necessary? Would that be helpful? Or, and would yeah. that be possible? Right. I think it's yes to everything, but it's, it's a slow process and whenever lawyers get involved, it's even slower, right? Oh, but yes. for example, we are working with a bunch of peer companies on um, uh, raw, ma raw material property data for, for solids, right? Yes. Uh, and, and it requires alignment, what do you measure and how do you measure it? And 
again, going through your digital files, what is the recipe for a measurement? I mean, there, whether it's a, you know, viscometer or, um, or, or a particle size measurement, it's software. So yes. you need to be very prescriptive as to how you run it for it to even compare from one lab to the other. So that's one place where we're starting. Uh, the other thing is we do use external manufacturers for a variety of reasons. And all this stuff that we're doing, we would like to also apply it with external manufacturers. So that will require data back and forth, but we haven't figured out yet how we're going to do that. Excellent. All right, if we have no further questions, let's thank our speaker one last thank you. time.